Welcome to Empowerment Word Church, where we empower people with the Word of God to live, fulfill, and be. Live a life that's pleasing to God. Fulfill the plan of God for your life and be witnesses and ambassadors in the earth for Christ. We are led by pastors Sean and Gwen Edwards. Visit us on the web at empowermentwordchurch.com. God, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to stand here and share your word. God, I believe I'm anointed to teach and to preach your word, and I believe the people that are watching, that are here today, are anointed to receive your word. God, I declare that your word shall fall on good ground and produce a harvest in the lives of the people today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, host minister. Appreciate y'all, our faithful few, man. I thank God for you. I thank God for you. I really do. Because um, God can use one and put a thousand to flight. Amen. Two can put two th- 10,000. So, amen. We thank God for you being here. So, today I want to f- pick up with this. Um, it's a very short commandment. It really is. But it has a lot, a lot of weight to it in the sense that as I've been meditating and, and kind of digging in there and And so as we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 13, but yet I'm going to go over to the New Testament and follow up because I'm going to go from the New Testament here. I needed some help with this because I wanted to hear Jesus' perspective and as it relates to this particular commandment. And so I'm going to title this this morning, Love of Life. Love of life, man, really loving life. And, and so I, we, we wanted to look at these Ten Commandments because we wanted to take a, a really closer look, but I believe they just as relevant today as they were back in the day when they were given to the nation of Israel. And so commandment six concerns man's life, never, never kill, never kill. Unfortunately, though, when I think about this, murder and lawlessness and violence are sweeping our earth, sweeping our nation. Hundreds of thousands of people are being murdered and slaughtered year after year. I'm going to go down in there just a little bit today. It might seem like it's a little heavy, but hang in there. The value of human life is almost worthless in some societies. So unfortunate. People have become so desensitized and hardened to the lawlessness and violence and killing that takes place in our world. Matter of fact, the internet, uh, the internet, uh, the front pages, uh, the the newspaper, uh, also television, I said, radio, are usually filled with all this violent and, and crime incidents. You see a lot of stuff. You can Go out there and you can Google, see all kind of stuff. But in, in addition to that, you got the um, entertainment industry, television and movies and video games. Oh, I, got a th- I got a story about video games. I got a story because my son some years ago brought a video game into the house and it was actually teaching them how to do some really bad stuff. And so I saw the influence. I, I, I about had a, a hissy fit, as they want to say it. I guess I just... I, I, I didn't know that video games can actually teach young people that kind of stuff. So, so video games and music and books, all these things and magazines, all are focused on lawlessness and violence and killing as well as immorality. Not to mention, I believe, that, that social media is inundated with videos that promote violence. Matter of fact, you don't even have to turn your cable television on anymore. You can, you can just stay on Instagram or stay on Facebook videos and see all kinds of violence and foolishness. Because life, to me, I think life is pictured as cheap, both by media and entertainment. My, minds of people are daily bombarded by this act of, uh, this act of lawlessness and violence and killing. I'm, I'm kind of setting this up here. Because no wonder we have become so desensitized. No, no wonder we've become so hardened to violence and murder. No, no wonder, yeah, it's okay. You know, no, no wonder you can see some things happen and drive by, not be, even be alarmed, uh, not at all. Because we see so much and we hear so much in our everyday life. So this particular subject this morning, as I deal with this particular commandment, um, it's desperately needed. Commandment six. It's strong, though. Strong. It's real, real strong. But I was thinking about as God was giving these to Moses and he's dealing with the people. And he's trying to make sure that that man respect each other, that we never kill. And so men need to be held accountable. You're going to hear some things you might agree, you might disagree, but the reality is I'm going to stay with the text. So Exodus chapter 20 verse 13 says this in it's four words. It says, you shall not murder. 
Some of your texts says kill. I don't know the last time we heard some teaching on that, but I, listen, I knew I was coming to it. Matter of fact, we got, I think we got adultery next week. Woo-wee. It, 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 gets, it gets down in there. You should not murder. I know that the King James Version says in this verse that thou should not kill, but all modern translations, I believe, and most accurate translation is that you shall not murder. We're talking about loving life. You should not murder. There's a difference between killing and murder. We'll see just a little bit here in the message. Now, a lot of times when you're dealing with this thing about killing and murder and all this kind of stuff, you can't, I, I don't have the, enough time to just, just park and spend a week or so here just talking about that. So I'm going to do my best to really just uh, pull some things off here for us. Because the Hebrew word, when I think about kill or killing, it means premeditated. Somebody say premeditated. It means planned. It means deliberate. It means intentional. It means unauthorized murder. And so when I think about this here, he, he's given us this command, you shall not murder. I know this is Old Testament. And we're going to peek in the New Testament here in just a moment. But this commandment can be broken either by a planned murderous attack against a person. So you, you see the implication here? It's got to be planned and premeditated and, and, and really thought out. But, but what's the charge of this commandment for all of us? What's the charge? You shall not murder. You should not murder the, the commandment. I know it's forceful. I know it is. When I was preparing, I said, Lord, you, Holy Spirit, you got to help me with this. But it's directed to all of us personally. We all have a responsibility even to each other. And God knew that with all these people, man, he, he, he knew that. He said, you should not murder the motives and the emotions that arouse in a lot of us to murder, that desire that we get. Sometimes folks get this desire to hurt people, the passion and the greed and the anger, man, that comes up and the wrath and the revenge that people try to get. Man, I got to get my, I got to get revenge. No, no, no. Because God knew about this here. And so he, he put this in here for us. We got to learn how to, how to control ourselves and, and put those things down. We got to control ourselves. And that's the challenge with a lot of people. They've allowed some things to fester. See, you might not realize how much violence that you are being programmed with every day. You might not really realize it. Did you know that by the time a child reaches uh, middle school, that they've already watched over 8,000 murders on television? Matter of fact, by the, by the time they reach middle school, they've seen over 100,000 acts of violence. Man, that's a lot. And we wonder why kids are so easily and young people are so easy to turn to violence. In America, at least every 22 minutes, someone is shot, stabbed, or beaten, even strangled to death. We, we, we have the highest rates, one of the highest rates of homicides in the world. We really do. More children die from violence than they do from sickness. They really do. It's so unfortunate. But one of the things I'm going to come home a little closer is I have the privilege of working in, in the law enforcement profession. And one of the things I saw for this year that has always concerned me, even as a man of color, that even across the nation, people of color are hurting each other like a sport. And I often wonder, what, what is that about? And so when I think about even in, in Birmingham, and I think about out of the 87 deaths we've already had this year, out of 87, 87 deaths, 80 of them are people of color, black people. 80 of them. Last year there was 93. And almost the majority of them were, were people of color. And so this is real, man. Satan has used this as a tool. He's used this as a tool. He, he really has. He, he's used this. And, and if he can get back at God by allowing folks to just run rampant out here and hurt people, man, he's winning. But I want to take a look at how Jesus uh, he takes this thing to a different level. He applies it to the heart. Because at the end of the day, precious people, at the end of the day, when it comes to this, it's about the matter of the heart. All those folks that he gave that law to and even God speaking to us today, it's, it's a matter of the heart. What is it that's in your heart that causes you to go so far that you'll hurt somebody? You know, that's why it's always easy when I think about folks who, when I think about the violence that takes place, and I wonder why, why is it so easy for a person to take somebody's life like that? Well, God reminded me about value. He said when they stand and look in the mirror themselves, they don't value what they're looking at. And that's why it's so easy to go and hurt somebody else. We first got to value ourselves. So let's see what Jesus says 
In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, he says, uh, you've heard it, it was said to those of old, talking about ancestors, you shall not murder, or whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, or empty head, or call him an idiot, and his anger is building up, shall be in danger of the council or danger of, of going to court, right? But whoever says you fool or really curses shall be in danger of hellfire. See, Jesus taught that this commandment means far more than just prohibiting people from killing, right? Because he enlarged the meaning to include both anger that is aroused within our hearts. See, where it starts, the, the, the lawless motives that drive people to hurt each other. It's a matter of the heart. See, sin comes out of the heart of man. That's real talk. The first murder, matter of fact, the first murder was in the family, according to the scriptures. Y'all remember Cain killed Abel, right? He sure did. Why did he kill him? Well, he killed him because of jealousy, which led to what? Anger, which led to murder. You see the progression? Matter of fact, even in the text, note the progression Jesus is given. He gives this emotional anger outburst. He says, and anyone who says to his brother, Raka, or empty head, or idiot, or, or allow this to fester, because this thing is, he, he, he's starting to allow this hate to build up. See, our stages in life, when we're talking about getting to the fact of murder, it's a progression. The Lord is reminded, Jesus is reminded, listen, we need to handle this thing at this level and don't allow it to progress. Don't allow this thing to progress. And then he says murder in danger of hell's fire, fires of hell. Because the growth of, da of, the, the growth of anger is dangerous, y'all. Because I truly believe unresolved anger will fester. It can, be, it, it can become so uncontrolled and it can give birth to murder. It really can. Some of you know some folks who got really angry. Some of you have been in some fights growing up in your, on yourself, and you think back, like, why did I get in that fight? What was that about? Some of you have seen some things, and they go, man, because emotions, y'all, are powerful. And if you don't control your emotions, things will happen. That's no different than road rage. Some of the best Christians that I know cut up when they experience road rage. And why is that? See, see Jesus is talking about what's in your heart. Oh, I, I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. You said it because it was in your heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It'll tell on you every time. So don't so this thing, oh, you know, no, no, no. This, this thing, these emotions, man, they can stir up trouble in ourselves and they can stir up trouble in other folks. You ever notice how children, uh, they, they follow the example of their parents? You, you, you ever seen somebody cutting up and you go, and, they, and their parents show up like, okay, that's where they got it from. Oh, that's where they got it from. Or, or, or you can influence a friend. You ever had somebody to influence somebody? We used to call it back in the day teasing somebody up or erging somebody on. You know they're talking about you. You know you start saying stuff to things, right? I remember several years ago, uh, there was a disagreement on Facebook that involved a group of young girls. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep, keep some of the specific details because somebody might be watching and might be connected to the family. But the Spirit of God brought this back for my example. There was a disagreement with a bunch of young girls on Facebook. And they, they, they basically planned out a fight that they was going to get together and they was going to fight between the two of them, right? And so, so they, they, went, they ended up going to the park. Now these girls, and you know, just, just now getting to high school, they, they ended up meeting at the park, but it started on Facebook, all this talking and people talking and urging people on. And so they got to fighting. But several of the friends who was with the girls, uh, shots rung out. And all of a sudden that young girl, three people was hit, but that young girl was killed because of some stuff on Facebook. That started, people started beefing amongst themselves. Where, where, did, where did that come from, beefing? And it used to wonder, so, but, but, but I understand it's this violence thing, man. This anger stuff can be contagious. We got to be careful. Sometimes we say stuff out of our mouths, but, but Proverbs says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man or you may learn his ways. That's Proverbs 22, man, 24 and 25. It's, it's in there. So this sixth commandment is, is often misunderstood for, for misinterpretation. I, I just want to cover a couple of broad areas. I, I want to talk just a little bit about 
what this commandment does not mean and what this commandment does mean. So what this commandment does mean, when I think about thou shall not murder, it's, it's, it's direct, man. This is forceful. And I know some of us, somebody saying, Pastor, I ain't hurt nobody. I ain't killed nobody, this and that and the other. But Jesus is talking about what's in our hearts. <laughs> you didn't lay hands on that person, but you're thinking it in your heart. You're holding stuff against them in your heart. So the commandment does not mean, here we go, it does not prohibit killing animals or insects. Yeah. God does not contradict himself because when I saw Genesis 9 and 3, what did it say? Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. You don't have to be a vegetarian. You can, you, it's okay to eat animals and meat. It's all right. It's okay to hunt and all that stuff to get food. Jesus ate meat, right? So it does not prohibit or ban killing animals and insects. That, 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 that's some clarity, what it does not mean. Here's another thing that it does not mean. It does not prohibit capital punishment. Now, this one here, just hang right here with me. It does not prohibit capital punishment. Where are you going, Pastor? Because we, we got to take this into context and the history of what was taking place. We've already defined in the Hebrew what killing means, that it's premeditated. And so when I saw Leviticus 24, 21, part B, it says, anyone who commits murder shall be put to death. See, there was an accountability thing going on in, in, in the Testament, in the Old Testament, and, and how, what God was trying to instruct. The principle here is a life for a life. I remember seeing a term called lex talionis, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. God had delegated authority for this to the government. I'm going to take you somewhere in just a moment. Because God carries out revenge by punishing wrongdoers. And you're going, man, we don't get a chance to hear that much about God. The only God that we always hear about so much, oh, is this loving God, this blessing God, and this and that and the other. But God, listen, he, he, he wants to deal with wrongdoers and murderers really quickly. And I'm going to show you in just a second. Because all the courthouses back in the day used to have the Ten Commandments displayed out there, right? Yeah, you, you see where our foundation came from, our foundation that, that, that really carved our legal system. And so th this wasn't just made up because God desires swift judgment. Why you say that, Pastor? Because in the New Living Translation, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, here's what he said. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. Why we serve a God like that? I'm going to show you. For God made human beings in his own image. See, a lot has changed, though, with our appeal court system, I believe. But it's primarily, why have our systems kind of changed? It's primarily due to innocent people being killed on death row. I don't have time to get into that. that, that we, we've actually killed some people in our court systems, in our correctional systems, that people who had not committed crimes. We've seen movies. We've seen all the stories. So that has kind of paused a little bit. Matter of fact, a large percentage of sentences, even today, people who are on death row, uh, who initially had death sentences, it, they've been commuted. What does that word kind of mean? It means to a reduction in punishment. There were a lot of people who were on death row, even in my research that were on death row, who were sentenced at the age of 16 and 17 and 18, and the reality is they were still teenagers. In the law, you can't really put a teen to death like that, and so their sentences were changed. But it doesn't prohibit capital punishment because we're talking about some premeditated. I'm going somewhere with this. In 1901, the 25th president by the name of William McKinley, he was assassinated and his assassin was caught and convicted and executed 53 days later. I'm talking about swift. But that can't happen today. But I think about people like Ted Bundy. And I'm bringing some old rough stuff because my background is in the criminal justice world. Ted Bundy, man, Ted Bundy went on a college campus and went on the campus and, and killed some young girls who was in there in their dorm rooms. And it, it took 11 years before he was executed. I'm not a fan, and I'm, I'm going to share my personal opinion here in just a moment. I too much, I don't often always share my personal opinion when it comes to preaching you guys or giving you guys the word and the gospel. But, but, but as a pastor and as a leader, I just want to share with you where I'm coming from because the Spirit of the Lord dealt with me on something. But there are people who are on death row who have done some heinous things, and I'm not a fan of 20 and 20 and 30, 40 years on death row and taxpayers' money, and there's really no deterrent because it takes 30 to 40 years to hold somebody accountable. If a man goes in a neighborhood and kills a whole family, but he's on death row for 20 and 30 years, 
What's the deterrent? What's the penalty? It wasn't swift. See, some say capital punishment. I'm going to talk this in just a moment. It really doesn't work. But some folks say, well, it worked for the individual who committed the crime. But so, so, Pastor, what are you saying? Can a murderer, first of all, can a murderer be saved and forgiven for his sin? I'm going to put that question there. And I wrote, absolutely he can. Because Scripture says he's got to confess and re genuinely repent. He can. He got to turn away from that particular life of sin. Let me, let me just say this. And so, Pastor, what, what's your thoughts? I know folks will say, what's your thoughts on, on, on death penalty? Listen, I believe in life, man. I believe in life. But I also respect I respect the laws of the land. They're ordained by God. And I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 13 because when I found that text and I studied that whole chapter, I saw law enforcement. I saw order. I saw government in Romans 13. When you ever get a chance, study Romans 13. But I'm just going to give you a piece of it today. Because so, so my question would be, that I was asked before, that well, what's your thoughts? on so people do these heinous crime and, and they got to be sentenced to death. And, 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 and do you believe in all that? Well, here's the thing. I'm not a fan of taking people's life on any side. I'm not a fan. I, I believe they should live. But the reality is the law, I respect what God gave us, and the laws of the land were ordained by God. Where are you going with that, Pastor? Because the reality, if a man was on death row and he, hurt, he killed multiple people, and the laws of the land said with his life that he has to pay, but can he be saved? And, and one time I was sitting and I was thinking, and God was saying, son, let me tell you something. Flesh cannot see me. I said, what you talking about, God? He says, flesh can't, can't, can't see me. He, he said, only the spirit. So he said, you have an opportunity. So a man that's on death row for killing a multiple family, a man that's on death row who's killed a family can genuinely repent, and his spirit can go to heaven. How? Because if he repent. But guess what, precious people? According to what God gave us, according to the law, the laws of the land, with his flesh, he's going to pay the price to that state. There's a difference. There's a difference because if you go out in your flesh and Satan uses you and you go out and violate the laws of the land, well, the laws of the land said what you did, the penalty is death. Oh, well, we can't kill people. No, 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 no. You can't listen. Evildoers have to be held accountable. Watch this. Go to Romans chapter 13. I'm just going to read four verses to you. I want you to see this. And when you get a chance, study Romans 13 out. It, it, it opened your eyes to something totally different. God knew exactly what he was doing. He needed accountability to men. Thou should not murder. Premeditated stuff, intentional stuff. Watch this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are what? Appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority... Resist the ordinance of God. When, when we buck against the criminal justice system and all the things that are in place to keep stuff from being totally chaotic, and those who resist will bring judgment on what? On themselves. Not judgment from God, but judgment based off of that system. If you go out and break into somebody's home, the penalty for that is probably a big fine or you're going to spend a, a year in jail. You can't argue at the system God ordained this because if he didn't have laws in the land, it would be straight chaos. Y'all remember the Wild Wild West days? You ever seen those cowboy movies? It seemed like every family handled their own stuff with a shotgun or a rifle. You, you, you can't have everybody taking the law in their own hand. Watch this, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to, to good works. In other words, law enforcement, those individuals, they, 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 are, they are not a terror to good works. We embrace good works. We don't bother folks who are law-abiding the citizens, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? He says, listen, do what is good. See, if you're a law-abiding citizen, do what is good. If you don't want to worry about it, nobody knocking on your door saying they got a warrant for your arrest, do what is good. If, if, if you don't want nobody coming, if no search team or no SWAT team coming to kick in your door, don't go out there and kill nobody. So, so, so it's real talk. You can't get away from this. Watch this. Uh, do, he says, uh, do, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister. Oh, man, he, he called us to you for good. But if you do evil, watch this. All you folks breaking the law, all you folks want to commit heinous crimes and hurt innocent people, he says, uh, he says but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. 
for he is God's minister. So when you see law enforcement now and those who uphold the law, listen, God said, those are my ministers. They're working in the earth for me. So when I found that as a young law enforcement officer, the Holy Spirit led me to Romans 13. I was like, wow, what I'm doing is ordained by God. You ever wonder why, why people have a really big thing against law enforcement officers? Let me say this. God showed this to me. This is something spiritual for me. It ain't for everybody. He said, son, that badge represents good. It represents light. He said, when you show up on the scene, you show up on the scene where there's chaos and there's darkness. He says, light and darkness is going to always war against each other. There are some people who I just don't like these kind of folk. And you ask for why you say you don't like law enforcement. That, 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 those people are doing a job because it's needed. Now, the individuals that you have to deal with individuals based off an of individual basis. If an individual go and do something crazy, he need to be held accountable. It doesn't matter if you're in uniform or you're out of uniform. You need to be held accountable. But he says, for God's menace and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Here's the third thing. It does not prohibit going to war. So it don't prohibit a capital punishment. It don't prohibit killing animals. It don't prohibit going to war. Why do you say that? Ecclesiastes said it in 3 and 8. It's a time to love. It's a time to hate. It's a time of war and it's a time of peace. It is right to defend ourselves and to preserve freedom for ourselves and our children. It, it really is. I remember Edmund Burke, a political speaker from the 18th century. This is what he said, and y'all have heard this before. Edward Burke said this. He was an 18th century political speaker. He says, uh, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. All that is necessary for evil to triumph. So you, you stay in your little world and you don't get involved. You see somebody doing something illegal. I ain't finna call nobody on them. No, that ain't my business. Oh, I don't, I don't say nothing. I don't, see, I don't see no evil. I don't hear no evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, that's the problem. All that is necessary for evil to triumph in our nation is for good people, good, uh, good folks, Christians to do nothing. It's real talk. We, we got to be thankful for men and women who have fought and killed in war and went off the war to protect our freedoms. You just, you just have to. That's just part of it. So what the commandment does mean, and I'm wrapping this up. I talked about a few things it didn't mean, but what does it mean? I just started off with this. God says preserve life. The whole purpose of this, thou should not murder. God says to preserve life. Why? Life is precious, man. It really is. It's precious. The whole purpose of this commandment is to teach, preserve life, to teach people the sanctity of human life, that they ought to honor, we ought to honor human life. And majority of us do. We do. We're created in the image and the likeness of God. Therefore, man's life is of infinite value to God. Your life means something to God. Your life matters. It's valuable. Every life is valuable. Man is God's creation. Yeah, his creation. God's royal masterpiece, God's precious possession, God's priceless property, man's life. That's where the sanctity of life comes from. It separates us from animals. It does. We got to treat human life and respect dignity. Here, here's what the commandment also means when I think about it. God says to preserve life. What does it mean? God says no to suicide. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but he says no to suicide. How to package this? Because suicide is the number two killing among college students. God says no to suicide. Number three among high school students. People say, it's my life. I have the right to take it. That's what folks sometimes folks say. No, you don't. The Bible says you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Your life means something. You were made in the image of God. God loves you. One, one thing is sure, though. A desperate suicide to escape this life and all, that, it's all the trials and the challenges and the problems we face, that's a desperate crime, a crime that never should be committed. God says no to suicide. I know suicide happens. It happens way too often. But it's never the answer, though. I've witnessed, not witnessed, but I came in right after some suicides was over. And the, one of the things that stick out is I think about the families, the people that were left behind. 
And I think about how Satan used, start allowing that to fester in his mind and in his heart. God has stamped his image on every human being. God got his stamp on you. His stamp is on your life. And no person should ever destroy himself. Why? God forbids it. You were made in his image. You matter. God loves you. You matter. God loves you. You matter. I mean, that, that he, he loves you. God says no to suicide. And not only does he say no to suicide, he says no to mercy killing. I put a word in parentheses, euthanasia. I put that in there because we've seen this on the news. We've heard about this. Because killing someone because of old age or deformity or incurable disease. I'm, I'm not talking about having a living will. A lot of us got living wills. My, my, my folks got, mom got living wills. I'm, I'm talking about them living wills that, that they choose to keep alive artificially by a machine or medicine. There's some people put in their living will, don't you keep me up. If I'm a vegetable, don't you keep me living on those machines. My mama made it very clear to me. I said, yes, ma'am. I got a copy of her will. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just killing folks just because they're old and they got a disease that's uncurable. I've seen this guy on news, or some, he, they call him Dr. Death, assisting with deaths and people want to leave here. God says no to mercy killing. He says no to that. Job 12 and 10 says, in whose hand is the life of every living thing? Whose hand? And the breath of all mankind. God holds that. So when I think about euthanasia, it's a slippery slope. What is it? It's the practice of intentional ending a life to relieve pain and suffering. That's what it is. Who determines when another person should die? Who gave you the right? Who gave you the right, man? You know, I experienced that with my dad. 2005, dad had surgery. The doctor told me, he met with me at Princeton Hospital. He said, hey, um, let me tell you something. He said, your father is very, very sick. I said, yes, sir. I was looking at his eyes, I was looking at his body language, his doctor was talking to me. He said there's a 50-50% chance that he won't wake up out of his surgery. He said, go get everybody, go get your family, have everybody come on up here to the hospital. So I did that, I notified everybody, I told everybody. I went in and talked to Pops and said, Dad, I'm standing with the best, hey Dad, uh, listen man, you're in bad shape, Charlie. I said, man, you, Doc's saying you got like a 50-50. Now I know it's hard to talk, but me and Dad talk like that. I didn't talk to Pops, tell him what's up. You know, I, I just, I said, Dad, you say you got a 50-50 chance. If you don't have the surgery, stuff is going to go get bad on you. And if you do have the surgery, there's a good chance you might not wake up. So what you want, you know, what you want to do? It's like this had a surgery. So I went with the surgery. But he stayed in that coma. He didn't wake up out of his surgery. The doctor was right. But he went, whether well, it was a day or two. I, I, listen, I wasn't pulling the plug because I knew Dad was a fighter. And here I knew he was a fighter because... They told me that he had stopped breathing, but his heart kept beating for many, many, many hours. I said, man, that dude, that was a hard worker. That, that, man, I tell you, that, that heart wouldn't stop, but his body couldn't keep up with his heart. But I understand, but it didn't give me the right to say, hey, doc, pull the plug, pull the plug. Now I let dad ease on out on his own, but we had a discussion. Nobody gave you the right. And also God says no to abortion. I ain't gonna spend a whole lot of time there. I know folks jump up and down when it comes to this here, but as a believer, abortion is one of those major indictments, I believe, against the human race. Down through the centuries, it happens. But the sanctity of life has always been and still is under lethal attack, always been. But we're not in the shoes of the mother. We're not in the shoes of the unborn child. But tragically, I believe the tide of the public opinion usually runs counter to the clear commandment. God says you shall not kill or you shall not murder. Well, Pastor, what about in certain circumstances? I understand the circumstances. And even as a minister now, whether, whether it was, it was some, something really serious, really bad happened, we got to love that mother. We got to encourage and counsel her. We don't throw people to the wolves. We don't, we don't, we don't cast folks out. We really don't do that. But we got to encourage folks that God, 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 God's, you made it in God's image. It's purpose for that baby's life. Psalms 139. This might be my last text for the day. It is, I believe. Psalms 139, verses 13 and 16. This is what David is saying. Listen to what he's saying. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. 
I will praise you. Hallelujah. For I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what we be declaring, baby. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. See, we don't just make this stuff. We declare God's word, and you remind people, sweetheart, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Sweetheart, that baby is fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Like this fetus that's on the inside. And in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Did you know that between 18 to 28 percent of all pregnancies in America end in abortion? I saw some numbers from 2017. There were over 862 abortions in 2017. I couldn't find nothing from 2018 and 19 and 20, but I said, man, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, that's a lot of killing. It's a lot of death. Medical professions have said many things about the fetus and, or the unborn child in the mother's womb. They've got a lot of read us all kind of stuff. Or when is the unborn child to become a human? Or what about a mother whose life is in danger? Or what about an unborn child who, who's due to rape or incest? you got all these different scenarios. But as believers, we believe in life, man. I never can put myself in a woman's shoes or a mother's shoes, but she has to make that decision. But as the church... As the body of Christ, we got to embrace and love people. We got to embrace and love folks right where they are. We, 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 we got to favor not only life for the unborn, but we got to favor life for the mother as well. We really do. We got to show compassion and show love and show care. We have to do that. A love of life, having a love for life, thou should not murder. God wanted to communicate that to us. What if you kill someone physically or even maybe kill somebody even in your heart? You thought through that. What if you might experience, you, you've had an abortion before. You and God knows or whoever's close to you know. You hated somebody real, real strong before. But God reminded us, Jesus reminded us, be careful when you're cursing and you've got this strong hate because the reality is you, 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 have, you stand in danger of the fires of hell. God doesn't want that for your life. Don't allow that to take you to a place that you regret. you got to release God loves you. He loves you. He, listen, God loves you. Do you know how, when I think about do you know how much the Bible has written about murderers? See, I'm, so God is talking and encouraging somebody who might have experienced an abortion, who might have done something real bad, who might have committed a heinous crime, who, who might have conceived some things in their heart. But the Bible is written, has a, quite a few folks in there. Moses was a murderer. Yeah, he was. Matter of fact, David was a murderer. Matter of fact, even Paul who was a murderer, right? But God forgave him. Maybe you might be on the other end of violence. Maybe you feel like, you know, you have carried something for a long time and wanted to get past it. God was talking about some intentional things, some premeditated stuff. Some of the decisions we made as people the grace and the mercy of God. God loves each and every one of us. And God loves you. And if that's ever, if you've ever done that, if you have never genuinely repent, repent. It says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You get a clean slate. <laughs> God is not holding that against you, sweetheart. God is not holding that against you. You've genuinely repented. There might be some natural consequences. You think about it from time to time. That those are some things. But God ain't holding that against you. God loves you. God loves you, man. The God we serve. Oh my goodness. He see past all of that. God specializes in taking the unqualified and qualifying them. That's what he does. He takes a mess. It makes it into a success. He do that. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the God we serve. So have a love for life. Let's love each other, man. 
and treat each other like God wanted us to be treated. Amen. Come on, let's bless God right there, y'all. Come on, let's bless God. Amen. 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 Listen, if you're sitting there listening today and watching us online, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're there and you never had an opportunity to receive Christ, it's simple. All you have to do is repeat after me. While everybody is praying, all those online who are already saved, I want you interceding for the masses of the people. Amen. This, this is not as business as usual. This is a time where we cast out the net. And God has spoken to somebody's heart on today. Just repeat after me if you want to be saved and receive Christ. Say, dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he died on the cross for me so I can be right with you. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you today, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's bless God again, y'all. Come on. Amen. Listen, if you said that prayer, if any one of you said that prayer, listen, you, you are now part of the body of Christ. You're saved. And you don't have to worry. I encourage you to get connected with a word teaching church man. And listen, if you want to get some more information about this church, please go on the website. Uh, go on the connect, uh, get con contact us form and fill out that information and somebody will get back with you. Amen. And listen, we look forward to connecting you with you. Thank you for connecting with us. And uh, we look forward to following up with you. Amen. Y'all come on and stand to your feet. Amen. Amen. Love of life. Thank you for watching today. We hope this message has been a blessing to you. We would love to connect with you. Follow us on social media on Facebook and Instagram at Empowerment Word Church. You can also view this and other messages from Empowerment Word Church on Facebook and YouTube. If you are blessed by this message and would like to support the ministry, simply go to EmpowermentWordChurch.com and select the Give tab at the top of the page. Remember to live, fulfill, and be. And we'll see you next time.